In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Shine within our hearts, loving Master, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds that we may comprehend the message of your gospel. Instill in us also reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having conquered all sinful desires, we may pursue a spiritual way of life, both thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ, our God, are the light of our souls and bodies, and to you we give glory, together with your Father, who is without beginning, and your all holy, good, and life creating spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Okay, so uh, just give me a second that will be going to wrap it. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, Facebook works. Maybe too much. Load on Facebook here because of all the things being loaded into, into Facebook. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Facebook doesn't work. I was trying to figure it out. Uh, today's gospel is the continuation of what we read last uh, last time yesterday night, and you remember this was about Jesus being in front of Sanhedrin. And Sanhedrin is that body of the leaders of the Israelites who come together as judges, as, as a court, a supreme court, and a, and a minor court that was uh, dispersed throughout the country, and a supreme court that was in the city of Jerusalem. And they decide matters uh, concerning the justice and the people, uh, and the other things that they uh, relate to their people. So today's in today's gospel, this court is deciding uh, the destiny of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it? This man testify against you. But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? So we talked about false witness yesterday, that people who were witnessing against Christ were saying things that did not match with one another, and that by witnessing in that manner, uh, they were ultimately testifying against themselves, revealing the falsehood of their testimony, and that Christ did not have to answer to this kind of falsehood. I want to remind us, uh, us as uh, we study this, that Christ is the truth. Sometimes in our modern life, we speak about the truth as a um, uh, philosophical reality, uh, but Christ is the truth himself. Uh, for us, Christ is a person. I mean, I'm sorry, the truth is a person. And here you see the a parallel or contradiction rather 
between the truth and the falsehood. The falsehood accuses, brings false witness, and the truth is standing there and being who he is. What's the reason for that? For partially is because everybody knew who Christ was. They had seen him many times doing things, as he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they arrested him, he had been with them many times in the temple, and they had not arrested him. They had tested him there, they had asked questions, they had seen him perform miracles, and they had not uh, dared to try to arrest him because of the power that he had as a teacher and as a uh, as a uh, healer and as a savior ultimately uh, we see that one time when he is uh, when he is uh, uh, accused of uh, doing all these things by the power of the devil he goes out and heals the blind who was born blind uh, to simply display his power as a creator and that is what these people who were testifying against christ witnessed and their witnesses were not being uh, so powerful because in the depth of their heart they knew what the truth was we will see in a few chapters down the down the book as we finish the gospel of saint mark that uh, Pilate himself will ask christ what is the truth the question rather better question would be who is the truth and the truth was standing in front of him and that's what uh, the judgment is actually in fact christ has it teaches us that when we go to the judge with our accuser, we should uh, talk with the accuser on the way and uh, finish our deal with the accuser and make peace with them before we appear in front of the judge. Uh, because before, before when we, because when we appear in front of the judge, we were too late to even have a conversation with the accuser. Sometimes this accuser is considered to be the devil. But uh, many of the church fathers are teaching, saying that that's actually our conscience. And our conscience speaks from the truth. Our conscience is that small voice that speaks of the truth, with the truth, from the truth. And it is very easy to silence that conscience. And that's what we see in this particular text, that those accusers or those false witnesses who came against Christ, they obviously had silenced the truth in them, had silenced their conscience in them. And so there's an expression uh, that uh, it, this, the, the, the cause and the method, the, 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 the final cause justifies the method. And that usually happens on the account of silencing the uh, the conscience silencing the truth that is in within us how does that work that when we do something wrong uh, we always have a justification that is this is for a greater cause and although throughout the process of doing it a small voice from within us from inside of our heart is constantly reminding us that uh, that we are doing it wrong uh, however we continue doing it uh, with our mind with our uh, uh, with our intellect projecting goodness towards the future when the conscience speaks about here and now that you are doing wrong if you are creating wrongs here and now it is impossible to create a goodness in the future the future is built on the present. As I have said many times, there is no past and there is no future. There is only present, there is only now and here. And what you do, what I do here now, that's what determines our future. And then what we do today here and now, that's what becomes our past. And that's what 
we need to remember when we hear the voice of our conscience to be truthful in the moment, in the moment, so that the future is bright and the past is beautiful. If we continue doing the wrong thing with a false understanding of brighter future, we will always be creating a trashy past and we will always build a uh, future that we will not like. So that's what uh, false witnessing means. And that's why Christ is standing there humbly and quietly listening to them. Because he is that silent, beautiful, small voice of conscience of the truth that speaks simply by looking at them. And we will see that same thing happening with Peter, that Christ does not, uh, does not uh, reprimand him, does not uh, punish him or in any way or sort. He simply looks at him. But by looking at him, Christ, uh, Peter can, uh, can see, can hear the truth within his soul, although he had denied him uh, so many times. Do you answer not? What is what it is then uh, testifying against you? They want to answer. They want to engage him so that they can catch him in his words. And that is what Christ does not do. He is just there present. And But he kept silent, answered nothing against the high priest, asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now they have a direct question for him. Obviously, he did not lower himself to the level of the accusers to, uh, to, uh, to defend himself. And that sometimes happens. Um, unfortunately, even today in our modern life, when someone accuses someone else, and the truth is so obvious, just 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 uh, defending oneself uh, makes uh, the truth so much cheaper and it's not worth it sometimes you just have to move on and build a brighter brighter future and a brighter present and that builds brighter future and the life itself will test will be the best testimony against the accuser against the liar and so however they have to push him. They are pushing him in all aspects to, of, of life and in all aspects of um, relationships to find something to accuse him. And they ask him a direct question. When they ask him a question, he answers their question. When they accuse him, he is silent because he is the truth. And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven now in uh, modern christianity in some reformed churches and uh, sometimes even in a uh, our knee-jerk reaction to christ even in our churches is that he is a moral teacher and that he has a moral code for us that we need to follow and that through that we will have a better life and that's all is what's about christianity here however we see that he gives an answer to israelites that they do not like and that even if we use that today many of us may not like i am he says that is the short and uh the answer to the point what does i am mean it is the answer that Moses heard in the burning bush when he asked the name of God. I am who I am. And that was the forbidden, a taboo phrase in uh, the culture of Israel. Uh, why? Because God is a distant, awful God. When we see God, we will die. And that no one can ever imagine that God could become human. And here's a man standing in front of them and using the taboo word that only the high priest was allowed to use once a year in the Holy of Holies by calling God by their name. 
and he's standing there and he's referring that name to himself that he is that high god the god up in heaven the god who has led israelites through the desert the god who has given moses the commandments the god who has uh, fed them in a desert the god who has uh, helped them to go through the uh, red sea the god that has uh, given them the promised land and that is what is very difficult sometimes for uh, the modern world to swallow that Christ is actually incarnate logos of God that he's God himself and that's what becomes the accusation point for the Israelites to crucify simply crucify him then the high priest tore his clothes and said what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be this deserving of death. This was a uh, this was a crime uh, deserving death. Uh, that the, someone who did that such a thing who claimed to be God would would die, and that's what. Christ is that's what the truth was and there was no other reason to um, argue or engage with those who were lying about him but it was very simple he knew that by telling the truth he will be crucified that he will go through uh, death uh, by proclaiming that he's God then the high priest tore his clothes. What does that mean? That is a sign of blasphemy. That, that's the final uh, draw on something that has been uh, discussed and that Christ, uh, Christ goes, crosses that line where the high priest uh, tore his clothes as a sign of blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? We don't need witnesses anymore. The truth is there. They, all they needed is the truth, and the truth was. And they were unable to comprehend the truth, and uh, that's all was required for the crucifixion. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they will. Uh, they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Now, some of us may say uh, that this is a wrongdoing, but as we know, Christ had to die, and he chose to die, and he willingly went to his crucifixion, and all that is happening, in fact, uh, one of the evangelists mentions that in this moment, the high priest even prophesies, saying that it's better that one man dies for the nation than the whole nation goes uh, to waste or to destruction and that was a testimony and a witness that Christ is dying for his nation which is all of humanity and uh, the people who agree with it are kind of po 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 partially and, and in a sense on the same wavelength speaking about the truth then some began to spit on him and to bl uh, blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him prophesy and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands uh, what a shameful situation where uh, hum the human fallenness rises to the surface that we are so we have fallen so low that even the incarnate god standing in front of us could be ridiculed could be uh, struck down that even god who is incarnate in front of us in the flesh as human being is not good enough for us to be uh, reverent towards to care for to love to draw near to um, this is a the most heartbreaking part of 
uh, of this process of Lord's crucifixion, the tortures that are his given. Uh, even if he was crucified, just simply taken uh, by the authorities and crucified just to die uh, would be honorable. But he is being crucified after he is uh, tortured. And that is really heartbreaking for me from human perspective that I am human and humans can fall that law to do something like that. And even if it was not God that was being crucified, and even if it was not a human being, that cruelty would still be unimaginable and unacceptable. And that's what uh, brings uh, the heartbreaking um, uh, reality into the surface. So they began to spit on him and to blindfold him and beat him and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands one human being towards another human being being so cruel shows the level that they have fallen into i want to emphasize here and spend some time speaking about human nature sometimes when something like this happens sometimes when people do cruel things it is said that that is because of the human nature, that huma human beings are capable of such thing. And if we look at human history, we will see that humanity has uh, done awful things in, uh, in their, uh, in their, during their history. And the Church Fathers, however, disagree with this, that it is not the human nature that does these things, but it is the fallen human nature, the imposed nature on humanness that does this. The human being by nature is created good. And that's why there's that conversation between Christ and the young lawyer. When he comes to Christ and calls him good, and he says only God is good. And in that, in a sense, we see that Christ being incarnate God, taking human image to, to human nature, uh, becoming human, uh, kind of combines the two goodnesses together. That, that image of God that is the human being needs to be elevated and saved. That's the whole point of God becoming human, so that humanity will be elevated. Elevated from where? From the pit, from the fall that they had uh, fallen into. And that is a very difficult process, uh, because sometimes the dirt on the humanity, on the image of God, is so thick that digging your own is difficult enough. But then seeing the same thing on another who does not want to dig it is heartbreaking. And there is nothing you can do to forcefully or magically or miraculously change someone else's uh, uh, filth. Uh, yours is difficult. Mine is difficult enough if we are willing to work on our own. And sometimes we are even ashamed with the fact that we ourselves find ourselves in that position of acting from not the image of God, but from the filth that is on the that is covering the image of God, and that sometimes uh, we cannot help ourselves to bring up, bring to the surface the image and the goodness of the human 
uh, humanness, and that is in the image of God. And that when we see in others, we sometimes simply criticize instead of reaching out and helping. Uh, but the help begins at home, as they say. Uh, we are to start with our own image. And that's what Christ meant when he said, shine your light, uh, your light, and those who will see that light will glorify your Father who is in heaven. So everything starts at home. When we criticize someone, when we criticize something, we are to first look at our life. And sometimes we criticize others to hide our filth, to hide our uh, unhumanness uh, that has gone so far down. So uh, speaking of this event, when Christ is being beaten and ridiculed and spat on, uh, we can see that aspect of humanness who has fallen into a very, very deep position. And there is a new uh, branch of psychology uh, called family uh, family systems, I believe, where they have studied, they have discovered that even the worst criminal has in the depth of their heart the tender human being. And I have spoken to several psychologists who study this method of helping people. And some of them who go to the prisons and meet with very uh, bad criminals, criminals to the level of these soldiers and officers who were persecuting Christ, uh, and discover that if you can engage with these people uh, and uh, stay engaged and gain their trust, you will eventually discover a hurt human being in the depth, in the very, very depth of their existence. And sometimes it's like onion, peeling an onion and finding the core of it. And it sometimes causes tears on both sides in order to go to that depth. Sometimes, uh, not being a psychologist as a priest, when we try to help someone in that, in that condition, that position, we fail because uh, the, and it's, it's painful, because when you address the issue in its depth, the person kind of coils in and reacts in a very, very negative way. And that is a, that's a heartbreaking thing to see. Uh, and that's why sometimes we also, as priests, need to be careful and to refer people to, to a specialist, someone who, uh, someone who may need a careful, a long process of peeling those filthy onion leaves to find the inner core that is still very good. Uh, imagine if someone tried to help these officers and tell them that what they were doing was wrong. It, it, they wouldn't listen. They would not be able to hear it. And unfortunately, the process, imagine take one of these officers and try to help that person to discover that they are created in the image of the person whom they were beating, whom they were spitting on. Uh, it, it would be impossible to imagine, but time, patience, and professionalism would be able to produce results. That is the heartbreaking part, that's the difficult part, uh, that we need to imply, apply that kind of patience and that kind of uh, hard work to our own personhood. And in the result, when Christ is on the cross, these same soldiers immediately recognize that he was really uh, a prophet, that he died on a cross and the earth was shaken. And that's kind of where I would like to end today, that our humanity needs help. And that starts at home. And it's a long process, difficult process, requires patience, 
requires hard work and sometimes we just fail we fail miserably and then we have to get up and shake the dust off of our clothes and continue walking sometimes wounded sometimes bleeding and uh and, and hope for the best and in that process it's very important to keep in mind that we have not created ourselves that god is our creator and that ultimately he can help us to uh, discover his image within the depth uh, covered under the dirt in our humanness may the lord bless you in the name of the father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, eternal. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you. I'll see you next time.